Well, let's start off with some statistics. One in six children now have a developmental disability. That's a 17% increase over the last decade, driven largely by disorders like autism and ADHD. If we're going to reverse these trends, we need to understand what's happening inside the brain. Or how about this? 42% of high school students who drive do so while text, texting or emailing. 33% do so having drunk alcohol, and 22% have used marijuana while driving. A general trend is that adolescents tend to engage in more risky behaviors than their adult counterparts, and if you live in the Northwest, you're very familiar with this because we just had several adolescents think that it would be fun to throw firecrackers into the Columbia River Gorge, which, of course, led to devastating results. So I repeat, what in the world is going on inside their brain? Now, <clears throat> what I'm not going to do is answer this question specifically, but what I can do is tell you some of the tools and some of the advances over the last 10 years that have allowed us to tackle these questions more rigor rigorously. <laughs> now, my lab studies uses MRI to study the brain. Now, a lot of people are familiar with MRI from the hospital where we use structural images like the one that you see right here. That's really important for, for examining structural damage in the brain. But MRI can be used for other things as well, like function in the brain or activity in the brain over time. Now, if you've read the newspaper, seen the, in the popular press, or you've seen these types of images, this is what you typically see. We have some investigator doing some type of task, and they're relieved by some type of control task. So for, for example, we'll have them in the scanner, we'll have them open their eyes and close their eyes, and open their eyes and close their eyes, and open their eyes and close their eyes. We'll do it over and over and over and over again, do some type of averaging of that signal, and lo and behold, we can see the part of the brain that's more active when your eyes are open relative to when they're closed. Well, some people ask, well, why is it that we have to do this so many times and make the average? And the answer to that is because the brain signals are actually quite noisy, okay? So just like we have to average a bunch of political polls to get a sense of the true political climate, we have to average a bunch of the MRI signals to get an accurate estimate of where the activity actually lies, okay? Well, back in 1995, a man by the name of Brad Biswell decided to look at this noise a little more closely. And what he did is he put someone in the scanner and he had him do a typical task, just like we talked about before. So he had him go in the scanner and had him finger tapping and then rest, and then finger tapping and then rest, and finger tapping and then rest, over and over and over again. And lo and behold, he could see parts of the brain that were more active in tapping versus rest. And this is called the motor cortex. And then what he did is he took one of those regions, had the subjects go back in the scanner and just sit there and don't do anything at all. Don't move, don't do anything, just sit there and rest. He took one of those brain regions, measured the noise, and then correlated that noise across all the other voxels in the brain. And what he found was that the same brain regions that were activated when you're hitting, moving your fingers were also sitting there spontaneously oscillating with each other at rest while you're not doing anything at all, just sitting there. And so what that told us is that this signal in the brain, when you're not doing anything, is actually important. It tells us how different parts of the brain are communicating in this state. Now, the first question that often people ask is, who cares? <laughs> why does it matter while, why does it matter what the brain is doing when we're not actually doing anything? Well, probably one of the best examples of, of why this is so important comes from one of my mentors and colleagues, Marcus Rakel, who describes this activity in terms of the energy budget. So from all of that food you ate in the last 24 hours, where does all that energy actually go? Okay, so this is a, a, an image of resting metabolism in the brain. And we pointed out a couple of different parts of the body. And what you can see is that the brain is highly, highly metabolic relative to other parts of the body like the liver and the heart. And the reason is, is because despite the brain only being 2% of the body size, it consumes about 20% of its energy. Okay? Now, how does that energy change when the brain is actually active and you're actually doing something? Well, let's look at that. So here's the met meta metabolic activity at the brain at rest, and here's what it looks like when you're actually doing something like viewing words or reading. And what you can see is that it doesn't look like a whole lot is changing. And the reason is because 
the extra energy consumption of the, of the brain when you're doing something is only a small portion. It's only less than 5% of the total. And the only reason that you can see those fancy pictures in the New York Times or the popular press is because we can take a difference of those two images. So do we really only use 1% to 10% of our brain like Hollywood would, would make us believe? And the answer is no. We use, the brain is highly active at a very high rate nearly all of the time, okay? Now, <clears throat> what is this stuff important for? And so it's hard to often emphasize how important this activity is, but there is one example that usually kind of sticks for people, why this activity in the background is so important. So it may come to surprise to many of you that from nearly the unlimited amount of information that exists in your visual world, only about 10 to the 10 bits per second actually reach your eye, the back of your retina. That's about the same resolution of your Blu-ray DVD. By the time that information gets back to the next stop, what we call the thalamus, the information has been degraded even more. Now it's about 6, 10, 10 to the 6 bits per second about what you can see on the old school standard definition TVs. By the time that information gets back to the visual cortex, we're down to the 10 to the fourth bits per second, or what the kind of resolution you'd see on a video phone, or what Wikipedia likes to call the minimum necessary for consumer acceptable talking head picture using various video compression schemes. <laughs> okay. Now, the, about, the amount of information that you're actually aware of, consciously aware of, is about 800 bits per second, and there's no more, not enough information to even show video. This would be what you'd have on your voice over IP, or on the audio on your cell phone. So of course the question is, well how does the brain make sense of such impoverished data and provide us with a visual experience of the world that some people say is even better than Blu-ray DVD? And the answer is, it's this spontaneous activity that's happening in the background. It's filling all the gaps. In fact, the reason <laughs> why magicians have jobs is they can take advantage of this property of the brain and trick us into believing something exists that actually doesn't. Okay, so while, as the famous William James once said, well, it's part of what we perceive comes from our senses of the object before us, another part, and probably the larger part, comes directly out of our own head. So you can see of how this information has such a big impact on our perceptions and behavior, on why we think it's important to use to study mental health disorders, and to study risky behavior in adolescent populations. But there's a problem. The brain is billions and billions and billions of neurons that are tightly connected intricately across all those, all those neurons. And so, as neuroscientists have to figure out a way to condense that information to something that's simple enough to actually analyze, okay? So we do this through a mathematical discipline called Graph theory. Well, what is graph theory? Well, graph theory is all about the study of networks, where networks are simply collections of nodes. So nodes can be anything from people to cities to web pages that are linked by lines or edges. So that would be roads between cities, links between web pages, or friends between people. Right? Now, graph theory has been used to study all types of systems, from networks on the internet, to U.S. commuting patterns, to interactions of committees and subcommittees in Congress, assuming, of course, everything's running properly, <laughs> to protein-protein interactions in one-celled organisms like yeast. And what you can see from all these images, right, is it's not simply A connects to B, connects to C, right? And it's also not random. There's clearly some structure in here. So gravity does, well, how do we quantify these patterns and what do they actually mean to the function of the system? So <clears throat> there are some very simple measures, like degree. So some, some parts of the brain have lots of connections, meaning they have high degree. Some parts of the brain have few connections, meaning they have low degree. There's other measures like path links. So if I want to get information from the node on the left to the node on the right, I have to go over one, two, three jumps. So the path link between these two guys is three. But so other some more complex measurements as well, like the idea of networks or community structure, where we have various algorithms that are 
try to identify nodes that are tightly clustered and connected relative to other nodes. The idea of these systems is try to maximize the number of inter-community edges relative to the inter-community edges. Over the last decade, we've been using the combination of these tools to tell us something about how the brain's organized. And there's been some very important findings where we've now identified approximately 10 to 15 different systems in the brain that have various types of functions related to our everyday behavior. So, for example, the frontal parietal network that we're showing here in yellow is really important for moment-to-moment -moment attention and things like working memory, our ability to hold in mind phone numbers to be able to manipulate at any, any given time. We have systems like what we call the singular opercular network. This system's really important for sustained attention or holding in rules. So, for example, the reason why there's nobody has at least yet screamed at me and yelled out, liar, is because you know the context of this environment, you know the rules of the engagement, and you're at some, some part of the brain is holding that information in mind, and this system is one of the systems that's actually doing that. You have other systems, like the default system, that's important for internal mentation and planning, rumination, things of that nature, and other networks as well. Now, so you, you might imagine that these kind of behaviors might be related to risky decision-making and mental health problems. And this is why scientists in these days are so interested in studying these phenomena. Now, the work has gone further, where a group, our, our colleagues at Washington University have done really an excellent job to show that we can examine these types of systems not simply at the group or population level anymore, but also very, very intricately at in each and every one of you. Okay, something that Oscar Miranda Dominguez from my laboratory has coined a functional fingerprint of the brain. Okay, but we can also do other things, like we can measure the effect of drugs. So, but not only just the bad stuff, but some of the not so bad stuff as well. Like, did you have your coffee this morning or not? <laughs> In fact, these data themselves are conducted on one of our mad scientists, Russ Poldrack, who decided to do this, test this very experiment on himself, okay? But if, you can, if we can do this, it begs the question, well, can we also test other types of interventions on the brain in certain types of mental health disorders or um, in the case of risky decision-making? We believe that answer is yes. So here's an example of, of, the, of the brain in a, in, a, in a group of young adults. I'm putting a circle around the, that singular per that network that's really important for holding in rules, okay? Here's what that, here's what that system looks like in a peer match group in, in folks that have ADHD. And what you can see, it appears to be almost completely gone, okay? Now, when we put these participants on back under stimulants, we're going to see the system comes back to life. And so you can see, you can start to tend to see our excitement about our ability to test other types of behavioral and medicinal therapies for various types of mental health problems. But we don't have to do the work only when the problem occurs, but we can go much, much earlier. In fact, this is a picture of my daughter, just a few days old, and this is about the age that we can start collecting these data, or these measurements, and follow them through childhood, through adolescence, and beyond. So, what is happening in the brain of my child who has ADHD? Or why is my adolescent engaging so often in risky behaviors? Well, we can't definitively answer those questions yet, but these are the types of tools that neuroscientists are using today to be able to tackle these difficult questions. But we need your help. So we're currently in the process of scanning 10,000 children across the United States from childhood through adolescence. Visit the, visit the website, learn about these studies, and if you're in the catchment area and eligible, we'd love to have you participate. Visit brainfacts.org. Learn about other similar topics like this one, get education materials, ask questions, and give us feedback about how us neuroscientists are actually communicating our ideas. And of course, if you're interested in our outreach efforts, or you have other youth that you think might be interested in this type of work, visit our, visit our websites related to our outreach. We, we, we think that the work that we're, that's being done here is only as powerful as 
the, our ability to bring up the next generation of scientists. So I'll end there, and thank you. <laughs>